Thank you to the Friends of Cecil Sharp House for hosting this event. Friends of Cecil Sharp House is an organization devoted to traditional dance. Full disclosure, I'm on the organizing committee along with several other people here. Um, we organize monthly dances and a variety of other events. Our next workshop is a week from today and our next dance is the 1st of November with Bernie Culkin, who's here. You can find out more about all of our events on our website, which is fcsh.org.uk. And thank you to all of you for signing up for this workshop. Um, we had an outstanding response, both this one and the Contra one next month, um, which is very gratifying. And I hope that you all get a lot out of it. My name is Louise Siddons, and I'm a caller based primarily in Stillwater, Oklahoma, although I spend a lot of time in the UK. Um, I call English and Contra, and I've been calling for about 13 years. I run our monthly caller workshop here in Oklahoma. Um, I started calling positionally in 2017. Before that, I'd been using a variety of alternative role terms, as well as traditional gendered terms, depending on where I got hired. Today, I still defer to organizer preference, and um, that's another conversation that I think it's important to have, but it's beyond the scope of today. But again, I'm happy to chat afterwards about questions like that. Um, but I do find that many dancers and organizers don't notice the lack of role terms when I call positionally. It's a very flexible style of calling. This workshop is free um, and in lieu of a fee, and if you are able, we are suggesting a donation to the Albert Kennedy Trust, a charity that supports LGBTQ plus people aged 16 to 25 in the UK who are facing or experiencing homelessness or living in a hostile environment. I hope you're all also supporting your local dance organizations. Many people have been doing incredible work to keep us all connected during the pandemic, um, and uh, they deserve your gratitude, but also your money if you, um, if you have some to share. We have a lot of people here, so we're not going to do individual introductions, but if it's relevant, uh, if you jump in to ask a question or make a comment, please do say something about yourself um, when you do so. All right, so I'm going to start just with a definition. What is positional calling? Positional calling is a style of teaching social folk dance that emphasizes patterns, flow, and relationships between dancers. It's appropriate for a wide variety of contexts as the calls make no assumptions about the individual dancers present and therefore it adapts well to any group. Historically, positional calling has appealed primarily to teachers who are working in ungendered environments. And more recently, because of that, it's gained wider traction with dancers interested in gender-free experiences. Various strategies for gender-free dancing have existed for over 30 years, and they range from positional calling to alternative role names. In my experience, positional calling has the most positive results for dancers. They don't need to remember a new role term and positional walkthroughs emphasize transitions and flow uh, or punctuation in a way that traditional role-based walkthroughs often don't. And that makes the dance easier to remember. Positional calling invites dancers to think holistically about the patterns they're dancing, but it's also very relational. I spend a lot of time uh, when I'm working on my teaching and calling thinking about where dancers are in relation to their partner, their neighbor, their shadow, uh, and other dancers. So I uh, wanted to identify some ground rules for this workshop. Um, first of all, what's possible in a Zoom workshop? When I, when I first started talking about doing this workshop, uh, or more, more accurately, when people started asking me to do it, I was hesitant because we can't dance together. And it's very hard to talk about what works and what doesn't as a caller without having dancers to tell you if it's working. So we can't practice much, uh, and that is a pretty significant limit, but I'm gonna offer you my strategies for positional calling. We are going to look at a couple of dances, and thank you to those of you who filled out the pre-workshop survey and suggested some dances. We're going to use two of the ones that were suggested. We're gonna do that, and in the process of that, I'm gonna offer you some of the strategies that I use when I'm thinking about calling dances positionally. I'm gonna to try to answer your questions, um, and I hope we're gonna have some interesting conversation. I um, I'm an experienced positional caller, but I'm not the authority uh, and I'm definitely not the last word on it. For me, calling like every other part of social dancing is really collaborative and situation specific. So what works in one room or for one set of dancers won't necessarily work in another. What that means for me is that calling isn't formulaic. I think that the best callers work really hard to find formulas that work for them as they teach specific dances, but we don't just go to a list of terminology and plop it together in order and then say that. Um, we're always thinking about the specific dance and how it works. So the two dances that I chose to talk about today are dances that I have called in the past, but I specifically chose ones that I had never called in 
uh, Colin, that's not even a word uh, that I'd never called positionally. So, uh, so I was rewriting my cards, which is for me, one of the fun things about positional calling, which I, like I said, like I said, I've been doing it for about three years. Um, but I have a lot of cards that still say larks and robins or shoots and ladders or even gents and ladies. And so thinking about how to do them again, I am going to give you my suggestions. One of them we're going to work on together, but I'm not saying like you should take these notes and copy them down and, uh, memorize them and do them religiously because that's not how it goes. There are a couple of rules I want us to stick to. The first rule is that change is hard, but also change is inevitable. A lot of the stuff that we're going to do today might sound weird or uncomfortable. And you might be in here saying there is a tradition and we must stick with the tradition. I think honestly, if you thought that you wouldn't be in here, but I just want us to think about the fact that whether it's positional calling or whether it's sort of, I thought that solution worked really well. And then I did it in front of dancers and it failed miserably. Change is inevitable. Don't get too wedded to one way of doing anything. Similarly, number two, there's no one right answer. Number three uh, is about practice um but it's also about preparation so there's the cliche a poor workman blames his tools i think that's true to a certain extent we've all experienced callers who have the exact same tools as we do as callers but who are not calling as well as we might hope they did and so it's not the calls it's how you use them at the same time as my grandpa used to say um you should always buy the best tools you can afford and what he meant by that was if you buy a cheap tool, it's going to break really soon and it's not going to work. And you're just going to end up spending a lot of money on four hammers instead of one. But for my purposes, uh, when I'm thinking about calling, I really did uh, kind of shop around, right? I've called with a lot of different techniques or styles or terminologies. Um, and for me, positional calling has turned out to be the best tool that I can find. That might not be true for you. If you experiment with positional calling and you're like, eh, this just isn't working for me. There are very few, I don't, I can't even think of one dance community that says, if you call here, you must use positional terminology, maybe Heather and Rose, but even there, different callers are doing it different ways. So that is all to say in the spirit of rule number four, our task today is to listen, to learn and to reflect. You don't have to use everything that you're being offered by me or by other people in the workshop, but I would ask you to think about it and at least give it a chance. I also wanted to start with some premises. The first one being whether or not we as individuals want to we as callers are losing a piece of information that we used to have. Uh, and that piece of information is gender roles. You might think, well, at my dance, everyone dances gender roles in a traditional way. But if I show up at your dance, I won't. And the number of times that I've been asked, are you the gent or the lady? To me says, well, clearly that's not a useful terminology because that's a much longer conversation between me and the caller or another dancer than it would be if we were just thinking positionally from the get-go. What that means, we're losing gender roles, is that it's not that we're choosing as callers to ignore information that's in front of us. It's that we're no longer getting that information. When dancers start to dance whichever role they want, then we don't have information based on who they are anymore. So our job as callers is to adapt to that change in information and help them succeed in a new um, environment. And I would remind you that even if it's not new to them, if they're totally used to gender switching or role switching or however we want to call it, it's still new to us. If we're new to positional calling, we're in a new situation and our job is to uh, adapt and to make them succeed. So premise number two, everything new feels unnatural at first, and then we get used to it. A lot of the feedback that I get about positional calling from people who are trying it for the first time is that it's hard to use language that sounds clunky or feels weird, but I think back to when I was first calling and it was hard for me to figure out the language to say things like first corner is set and turn single, like the order that that happened in and what words to use. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but everything sounds strange, right? Before you knew what a first corner was, first corners sounded like weird jargon. Then we get used to it. So every time you try something new, you're a beginner and there's a learning curve. What I would encourage you to do as you think about positional calling and you start using it is balance experimentation with your own comfort and with your dancer's comfort. Your perception of difficulty and discomfort will change over time like it did when you started calling in the first place uh, or as a dancer when you started dancing, all the terminology was un, uh, unfamiliar. Now that's not the case. Give yourself time to, uh, to do that learning. And then the third premise that is really important to me in positional calling, and I think in calling generally, 
is that the teaching is more important than the calling. A really solid walkthrough will give you a whole bunch of breaks in the calling itself because the teaching is where you give dancers the knowledge they need to do the dance. It's where you give them the clues that will help them remember. When you teach a dance, you are inviting the dancers to become your collaborators. And so teaching is hugely, hugely important. I can't state that enough. So as all of that implies, uh, this workshop is conceived of as an introduction to positional calling. I'm assuming that it's new to you. We do have a lot of experienced dancers and callers here, so it might not be new to all of you, but that's where I'm starting from. So I'm really gonna underscore point number two, that there's a learning curve. In the pre-workshop survey, I asked you if there are dances you're particularly curious about, and you made some fantastic suggestions, but they were also really difficult dances. A few of them were dances that I wouldn't have taught in my third year as a caller, let alone at my first calling workshop. So we're not gonna talk about those dances today. And it's not because we can't work out how to call them positionally. It's not because they're not doable. It's because it would take the whole hour to talk through and walk through them. But also we really do need to learn to walk before we can fly. Um, and one of the things I wanted to use this workshop for was to dig into the rationale behind um, positional calling and developing your walkthrough and your calls. So we're going to give ourselves permission to be new at this. Um, and we're going to do a couple of the more familiar and straightforward dances as our example dances. Um, although they do present real positional challenges as you noted when you submitted them. So our agenda today, part one, we're going to talk about people and places. Part two, we're going to look at dances. This is the part where we actually look at some dancing and uh, think about how we gather information from the dance. Part three, which we might not have time for, I am trying to keep this to the hour and a half allotted, but I'll at least make uh, a gesture toward the kinds of decisions that we have to make beyond the dance or beyond the choreography that we inherit. And then part four will be Q&A. You also, in the pre-workshop survey, submitted some really great questions. So we'll try to get to those. This is a workshop. I realize I'm doing a lot of talking up front, but um, in a second, we're gonna become all collaborative again. I do uh, encourage you to jump in at any point with questions. If I suggest we defer the discussion to the end, be understanding that I'm just keeping an eye on the clock, but also uh, it might be something that we're gonna cover later. So I might say that too, but otherwise I think it's important that we get our questions answered as we go. Because what I want to ask us is, what information do we have when we are thinking about people dancing? We might think about we have individual people, but we also have relationships, we have places, we have directions. So I'm gonna start by saying we obviously have a partner and y'all can unmute yourselves and just throw out some ideas about who we have or relationships there are, directions, positions. What do we know about dancers, geography and relationships? Name. Go up and down. Corner. In the set and out the set. Up and down. Yep, we have up and down. What else? Long diagonals. The set. Say that again. Same side of the set versus across the set. Have your opposite and right clockwise and counterclockwise. Ah, not anymore. But you have um, different types of sets. So you might have a long set, you might have a three couple set, you might have a square set or a circle. Whether you're a one, two, or a three, third couple. Or a fourth. <laughs> Don't forget or the guy Jackson. <laughs> For color, you can even have, well, maybe English too, but there are some that are just lines of people that are three, five, seven long. Yeah. Got top and bottom couple. Mm -hmm. Middles, middles, 
Heads and sides. Oh, I'm sorry, the presence at the top of the hall. In a square of first, second, third, fourth, depending on which country you're in, which way direction you go. <laughs> It's really just a position in the set, isn't it? Yeah. But well, maybe it's worth distinguishing between current position in the set and the original position that you keep throughout the dance. If that makes sense. It does make sense. Previous neighbors and next neighbors. Shadows. I missed that last bit. Sorry, Judy. Do we have above and below? Uh, shadows and or trail bodies or whatever you call them, as opposed to previous neighbors, which I think of as traveling the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. What about whole set and minor set, like in, you know, set dances? This is a fantastic list. Is there anything else obvious missing? In sets, triple minor or duple minor in long sets. Alone and together. Mm, nice. I think that's a pretty good start. We don't have to be comprehensive. We're not writing a dictionary. He says in front and behind. Oh, nice. Good. Okay. I'm going to stop there, uh, just since I said that we were being mindful of time. Okay, so the point of all this is that uh, really I wanted to demonstrate how much vocabulary and how much information we have without roles. That there's an awful lot of information that we know about the dance and about its choreography that we can describe, that we have language for. And also I wanted to underscore this is language that we already have. None of the things that you just told me were invented. None of them were unfamiliar to me um, and hopefully to most of you. So we have uh, all these concepts before we even talk about figures. We have a whole bunch of vocabulary that we can use to describe position. And uh, so I really, uh, in the workshop description, I said, you know, this one of the points of the workshop is to talk about how the skills we already have as callers, we can repurpose them for positional calling. And one of the things that is really key here is that we have terms and ideas that are standard, that are familiar. Um, and all we're doing uh, is really thinking about those familiar things in a couple of new ways, not even a lot of new ways. A, a long ways set is a long ways set regardless, right? That's not new to us. Someone, and because I can't see you all, I don't know who it was, said, you know, we have fixed positions versus um, relative positions. And this is a great example of how there are no hard and fast rules, because sometimes you'll want dancers to retain their identity. For example, if you have first corners, Sometimes you'll want those first corners to remember that they were first corners at the beginning, two thirds of the way through the dance. Other times you'll want the people in first corner position who maybe weren't the first corners originally to know that they're there. So you have choices about how to say things. You can say original first corners, or you can say on the second diagonal. And for me, the choice depends on what makes sense for that dance and those dancers. And the only way that you can really know that is by trying it. I think positional calling, one of the best ways to practice it is in your local community with a bunch of people who are open to trying. So when I say experiment, like calling is all about experimenting. One of the reasons that we run caller workshops is so that our callers can experiment. It's not just for new callers, it's for all of us who are like, well, we have this thing and we've never called it before. And it's a little weird, it's unusual. So even though I've been calling for over a decade, I'm gonna do that on some people who will forgive me before I do it in sort of public. Positional calling is the same way, try things out. One of the questions that got asked a bunch of times in the pre-workshop survey was, how do you identify individuals? We're not gonna go through every possible permutation of that, 
but I do uh, want to choose an example. And again, we're going to do this as a discussion. So how do you identify first corners when you are teaching a dance? On the right diagonal. How else might we describe them? And feel free to use all the ways that you've ever heard the first corners being described. This is not a positional section of the discussion. When you're teaching you know, new people the sort of orientation, you might have them look at your partner and then point at your neighbors and whoever's using their right hand is the first corners. What? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hey, doesn't everybody have a right hand? Don't most people point with their right hands naturally if, because most people are right handed? If you're looking yeah. at your partner, kind of like with the contra corners, if you point both hands at your partner and then you point to the person on either side, first yeah. right hand is the first corner. No, doesn't everybody, uh, not everybody is. So, let me try that. So the way that I would do it is I would say face across, point at your, I mean, I would do it like contra corners. I wouldn't actually do this in an English dance, but you could say point across, now point to the person on either side of your partner. If your right hand is pointing to someone in your minor set, then you two are the first corners. That's the right diagonal. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. First dancer on the kitchen side, second dancer on the parking lot side. Geography. I think right diagonal is a lot quicker and more straightforward. Mm -hmm. But doesn't everybody except a couple of people on the end have a right diagonal? No, you'd have to say within your group of four, you have to define the long wave set and say, uh, in your group of four or in your group of six, if you're working in a group of six and the um, say you've got the first couple in the middle place, um, like the contra corners, in, in, um, that could be in a long way set, I know, but I'm thinking in three couple set, often there's the first couple in middle place and you've got your first corner on your right diagonal, your second corner on your left diagonal. Yeah. Well, if we're, if we say take hands four in your ring of four, your partner's across from you, your neighbor's next to you, that other person on the diagonal, on the right diagonal, that's a first corner. On the left diagonal, that's a second corner. Yeah. For me, a lot of people cannot identify the right diagonal, which is when I do the contra corners thing of like point your hands and separate them. Um, but yeah, we're basically agreeing, right? Um, when I was taught first corners for years and years and years, the standard line, right, was first gent, second lady, you're the first corners. And the thing that, like when I said at the beginning of this, that positional calling taught me to teach dancers to be better. First man, second lady gives you no useful information about where you are in the set, right? Whereas uh, how many of us have had the experience as dancers ourselves of like, oh, my right and my left, that's not a natural thing for me to know. I always get them mixed up. So for me, reinforcing like, oh, my right diagonal is my first corner or right diagonals are the first corners uh, in an English dance. That is reinforcing my muscle memory about which is my right, which is useful, but it's also giving us information. It's saying, okay, I mean, we could think about all the ways in which that's useful. Make a right hand star. The first corners are facing into the set and the second corners are facing out. There are all kinds of ways in which that information becomes useful information for us as we think about putting all of this together. This example demonstrates all the things I'm saying, right? There are many ways that you can say this, even though I was the only person who resorted to role terms in this list. You guys came up with five or six different ways to teach and describe and identify who people were. I started out though saying, how do we identify individuals? That was a question that got asked a lot. For me in English dancing, I use top first corner and bottom first corner, top first, top second corner, top uh, bottom second corner. I use those all the time. And that's because above and below, I think is also useful information. However, I will say that in my experience, the number of times that I have to refer to an individual 
turn out to be vanishingly small because of the way that dances work as choreography. We're going to think a lot about how, again, we're not creating vocabulary that we can drop in in a kind of find and replace sort of way. We're creating a description of a dance, and every dance is going to be a little bit different. So this leads straight into part two, which is how do we gather information from a dance? How do we develop a walkthrough? We are going to look at turning by threes. As we look at any dance, I just chose turning by threes because one of you suggested it. We're going to ask who are the important actors and interactors? How and when do they interact? Is there a pattern you can explain? We're going to be thinking about people and how their roles are special in some way in the dance. We're also going to ask ourselves, what are the key transitions? Are there useful moments of flow? And who are you addressing as the caller when you're calling? You are not always calling to everyone in the room. Um, we know that, right? Sometimes we're calling to the ones, sometimes we're calling to the first corners. So turning by threes, we're gonna walk it through together. I apologize, I have a um, three couple set on my floor and this is a three couple circle, but I'm gonna try to walk it through and I want you to think about what's happening. This dance, I'm just gonna kind of do it the way that I worked it out positionally, if that makes sense. So the dance is a three couple circle Okay, so the first thing that I would ordinarily do in a walkthrough, I was to play a little bit of the music. So music is always nice. So that was the music and here's the dance it's by Gary Ridman from 2003. Like I said, it's a three couple circle. So I am in an arbitrary place in a circle because I don't have other people. So again, you're going to have to bear with me. If you want to stand up and think about this yourselves, you can listen to my walkthrough and see if it's clear to you. We heard the music. It's triple time. It starts in a circle of six and you have your partner next to you. If you look directly across the set, there is someone who's your opposite. That person is going to be your next partner. The dance is a mixer. So we start circling to the left and we do that for two bars and we turn single over our left shoulder and then we circle right and we turn single right. And then we face our, our partner out of that turn single and we do a back to back. It's a long back to back. And then it's two changes of a grand chain. So we pull by our partner right, the next person by the left. Then we come to another person and we do an, uh, a right hand turn all the way around. When you finish that right hand turn, you pause. Three of you are facing into the middle of the circle. We're going to start doing a set of alternating figures, starting with stars. The three of you facing in, make a left hand star, turn it all the way around, and then fall back on the last measure. The other three go in and they do a right hand star all the way around, they fall back. And now we alternate leading in a double. So the first three go in a double, that's six steps. As they fall back, the others go in a double. They pause, they turn out over their right shoulder they're looking at the person who was their opposite at the beginning of this time through the dance. They do a right shoulder round all the way so that they end on the right hand side of that person. And the dance starts again by making a circle and circling to the left. So that is how I uh, would teach it's turning by threes. And we're going to talk about what happened. I did want to mention before we discussed it that uh, one thing that's really important for me as a positional caller is that pause that um, in the dance, in fact, when I was walking it through, I didn't know the first time I did it uh, because I'm dancing solo. I had, I didn't think about which role I was. Uh, I just started walking through the dance and it wasn't until I got to the Allo man that I was like, oh, I guess I'm that role. Uh, I'm going to go first in these stars, or I'm going to go second. And I did not actually know um, until I got to the Alamand, which I was, because I wasn't thinking about it. I was just making sure that I remembered the dance. 
But uh, what I'm driving up to is that in the teaching, a lot of people, if you're going around a circle and you say, Alaman, right, they'll go around and then they'll all flip to face back into the circle. And you want to stop them from doing that. So when I do introductory workshops, I say, you know, this dance form, English dancing, contra dancing, it's like Simon says, where I'm the caller and everything that I say is Simon saying. And you don't do it until I tell you to. So a lot of that is kind of, you know, right hand turn, alamand, stop when you get there, don't let go, don't move, don't change direction, don't do anything until I tell you to, because that is how the choreography flows. And you don't need to be aggressive about it. I, when I was just doing it right now, I just said, pause when you finish your turn and notice that someone's facing in, someone's facing out. So uh, catching people before they try to change what they have done um, is really key. Okay, I am gonna put the slide with the dance instructions up. All right, so those are our questions. Who were the important actors? What are the key transitions? What were the useful moments of flows and who was I talking to? When I write out my cards, I do walk through text in blue and calling text in black. So I have replicated that here for you. This is roughly what my card looks like. How might we answer some of those questions? Um, what seem to be the important moments in terms of thinking about calling positionally? I love the fact that at the very beginning, you introduced the person who's exactly opposite you and said, this is going to be your next partner. Yeah. Yeah. And that was something, obviously walking it through solo, you can't figure that out, but that's something that you can prep. I use coins. I think a lot of people who are callers use little props to think about it. But I was like, yeah, who, like, who are you aiming for? Where are you trying to end up is a really important question for a positional calling. Because uh, if you can, like I said earlier, if you can make your dancers, your collaborators, if they know who they're heading for, they're less likely to screw up. Um, and that's good. What else was important? I think it was critical the way you said we're going to start alternating and then you sort of divided the people into those facing in and those facing out. And then you said this group and then the others and then the first group and then the others. Yeah, and that's uh, sort of for those of us who know the dance, that's obviously the moment where gender becomes an important part of the dance as traditionally called um, because it's uh, the way that Gary wrote it, it's gents doing one thing and ladies doing the other. And this is exactly the kind of thing, you know, calling in real life. I call for a variety of different groups, but my, my hyper local group is uh, pretty ungendered. They don't ever dance regular gender roles. And so if they're lost, I can't fix them, right? Like I can't look at them and be like, well, I know who you were. I know who you are. I'm just like, well, where's your partner? And who's the person you were doing the right hand turn with and like one of you face in and one of you face out and this is a mixer so it's okay if you got mixed up. But it's the facing in and facing out that matters right so when we think we're losing gender information, whether we like it or not. That's a really key thing is like if you think and call positionally, then you can say. Don't worry about it as long as one of you is facing in and one is facing out at the end of that element it's all going to work going to be fine. Can I ask a question. Mm hmm. Can I pretend I'm a beginning dancer or the set is full of beginning dancers and they're dancing it sloppily, as you would imagine. And at A2, seven, you know, bar seven and eight, they're not even sure where they began that right hand turn all the way. And so they're confused as to which person is even facing in and facing out. And so they stop and they ask you a question and yeah. they say, which one of us goes in for the left hand star how do you answer that do you make them do the right hand turn again from the beginning so they notice <laughs> or are you going i to think i mean them, or are you going to try labeling them no i would not try labeling them because i think that that adds to the confusion i mean there are people who would say you know what we're going to call this the a team and the b team or who would label them in some way and if that works for the dancers that you're working with that's awesome uh like i said there's not a right answer for me, it would depend a little bit on the group. With my student group, I would say, let's go back to the back-to-back -back and the two changes. Like you're looking at your partner, you're facing, notice if you're going clockwise or anti-clockwise. Um, and 
you know, if I had been spending uh, the amount of time on this that I would, if I knew I was going to teach it to beginners, I would have figured out the people who are traveling clockwise are going to be the people who are facing in, or that's backwards, but the people who are going counterclockwise are the people who are going to end up facing in. Um, and so then you can say that, like, were you going around your ring clockwise or counterclockwise? Okay, face the person you were doing a right hand turn with and turn until you are facing either in or out according to your direction of travel. You know what? I couldn't even process that fast enough to understand. Well, um, one I, of the things you would do is talk more slowly for a real Any dancers certainly can't process all that. Yeah, but if you were doing it for a beginner dancer, right, you would say, you've just turned single right, you're facing your partner. Think about what direction you're facing. Are you going clockwise? Are you going anti-clockwise? Now do the back-to-back. -back. Now moving in the direction you know you're supposed to be moving in, clockwise or counterclockwise, do two changes. If um, you are facing counterclockwise right now, you will end this alamand facing in. Do, I mean, it's not an alamand, it's a turn. But, you know, do the right-hand turn. Now you're facing in. Just three of you are doing that. So, right, you break it down, you do it slowly. Um, one, more, one more question, then I'll let you move on. Is it <laughs> ever appropriate to guide people this way by saying, if you started the dance on the right of the partnership, you do this. If you started it on the left, you do that or not. Are you never referring to original positions? I, for me, it depends on the dance. And in this dance, I did not find that to be particularly helpful information. For me, the right and left information that was helpful was that the person who goes in and then turns out over their right shoulder is also the person who's gonna end on the right hand side when they finish the right shoulder round and take hands in a ring. To say you are on the right of the person you just danced round with is helpful. But to point out that they started on the right way back at the beginning, not super helpful for me and for my dancers. Thanks. But yeah, if you're doing it in an evening where you've spent like the, the previous four dances, you've said one of you is on the right and one of you is on the left, which I do in Contra, uh, not a huge number of times, but a lot because Contra is very, very asymmetrical in terms of role actions. Yeah, you might want to say that, right? So again, like I think it's all about context and thinking about your program as well as uh, the individual dance. Thank you. Hi Louise, um, Jackie speaking um, from England. Um, could you call it three quarters uh, turn? The right hand turn? Yeah. I mean, you could, but if I did that, I would end up facing around the ring. So when you're doing your two changes, you, you start your right hand star or turn facing around the circle. Yeah, because you've just done a left. So you're kind of curving in to offer a right hand. And in fact, if they do it beautifully, then at the end of the left hand change, they're facing in if they're going to end facing in. But a lot of people just, you know. I mean, you can't trust your dancers to be doing it perfectly, especially the first time through when they're still working out the timing. Um, but yeah, uh, technically you're starting that right hand change or, or right hand turn in line of the circle and coming back to line. Um, uh, quick question. Do you actually use when you're calling the terms clockwise and counterclockwise or anticlockwise? I do. do I, I use them all the time. And people understand them. Yeah, and that's a, that's a thing where, you know, at, at first people are like, oh, I have to think really hard about that. And then after you've done an evening of going clockwise and anticlockwise, no one's thinking about it hard at all anymore. Louise, it's Brian in, uh, in England. Um, are you going to, for us, put the music on and call the dance as you move? Because my impression was the... Um, the teaching was quite verbose. Yeah. And you can't be that verbose when you're actually calling the dance. Right. And I'm not going to do that because of time. But as you can see, uh, like I said in the beginning, uh, on the screen, the blue is what I say when I'm teaching. And the black is what I say when I'm calling. And then obviously, as the dance progresses and people learn it, I say less and less and less. 
it's maybe four more words than I would have said using ladies and gents for the same thing. It, and I, I would feel just going back to the point that everyone's been talking about, this is Jeannie from England. Um, when it comes to the right hand turn, I would feel that I would want to say that about giving weight there yeah. in order to get the correct person in. And I think that would help considerably. It's just, I think it would be just worth putting in those few extra words that you're almost propelling that person into the middle. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can say about dancing this dance well, as opposed to just getting through it. And I think that's a key one. Um, I would say things about eye contact and kind of, um, yeah. Uh, I would also say that about the, the weight and filling the music in the chain, right? You have all this kind of uh, movement that you have to do, you have to get so far. And how does that feel good? Kind of what we were saying about the, if you do the left change nicely, then you're set up for that right hand turn mm -hmm. in a really useful way. But yeah, there's an awful lot you can say. Louise, this is Michael in England. Um, in my experience, the, the one place where people go wrong forgetting about being ladies and gents or anything else, it's actually in that very last bit where you have yeah. the right shoulder around. And, and looking at what you've got there, when you say turn out, you're talking to the people who've just gone in, so it's clear who you're talking to. And then you say right shoulder dance around, and now you're talking to two people because both of them are active. And then you go in your explanation to say, and you've got to end on their right, but you can't both be on the right. So I'm just no. a little confused how you get the clarity in that bit. And I think that is, uh, that's part of making it clear who you're addressing. And I, that's why I put just those three at the beginning of bars five to eight, because I'm reminding myself that this whole call is just to them. And I need to make that clear in my calling. Uh, how exactly I would do that would probably be a little bit different each time, but I might say, just those three you're going to turn out over your right shoulder and do a right shoulder dance around ending on the right let's break that down turn out over your right shoulder you should be looking at your opposite from the beginning of the dance do a right shoulder dance around with them so it's clear that i'm still talking to just the three and end on their right the stars in the middle you know the right hand turn into those stars really makes it a great dance for positional calling as long as you and the dancers are sort of calm about the possibility of going wrong, because it's very obvious who are the three going in, like separating those sets of three out from each other is quite easy in this dance. So as long as people aren't like, oh no, no, I was supposed to do it second. As long as they allow the dance to tell them what to do, it, it can work even when you are all in the wrong place all the time, because there's that one moment where it sorts everybody out, which is not a lot of people's ideal probably wouldn't be my ideal as a caller, uh, but can still be a fun experience for the dancers if you give them permission to just uh, let the dance guide them in that moment. Can I ask um, another question? Sure. I think this will help everybody. Suppose, let's, can we just pretend that there are s s three couples having just circled round left or right or something, and they're still in a circle, but you want the partner on the left now to go in and make a star. How would you tell them to do that? They're not why coming. Would, why would you the, do that? No, no. I mean, no. why would you want that? I just want to know how you describe that person on the left. You say the person on the left. Um, They're not I coming mean, out of a, a, another figure. Right. So, Judy, this kind of feels like a hypothetical that would be um, easier to answer if there was an actual dance involved. Because yes, absolutely. If it were a dance uh, where that happened, um, you know, like a lot of circle mixers, they do that, right? Like slip to the left, slip to the right, half of you go in. Right. Um, then yeah, I would have said at the beginning, you know, you have a partner, one of you's on the left, one's on the right. The people on the left are gonna go first. Thank you. When we go into the middle, done, right? I, I mean, I yeah, I wouldn't overthink it. I would just say that. Thank you. Sure. Louise, there's um, a question in chat that I think might, might yeah. be useful for everybody. Um, and it was, how do you set up the sets? Do you totally ignore which sex starts on which side? And Susan last asked that question. 
So in my experience, when I am calling to a group of dancers, if they are experienced dancers, and I say, make a circle of couples, three couples, they will automatically go in the position in relation to their partner that they are comfortable. And sometimes that's gendered and sometimes that's arbitrary. And sometimes it depends on the person they're dancing with. So I just, I don't, um, or at least in this dance, I wouldn't say where you should be. Um, in, in no dance, typically what I say where you should be. I would say if it was a three couple set and the twos are improper, I would say as you progress, you're going to discover that when you're in middle position, you're going to be on uh, the other side from your home side. I would alert people to the fact that they're going to be crossing back and forth the set as they progress. But in English dancing, typically I don't tell people where to be. Question. This is Bev from Toronto. So I've only ever called this dance as the variation for solo dancers or two dancers, <laughs> as opposed to calling it in an actual six person circle. Um, I'm just to go back to the questions about that last piece of the figure in B two five to eight. And I'm just trying to I'm trying to imagine in my own head, the turnout over the right, you've progressed when you're doing the right hand turn to start the stars correct mm -hmm. yep. um so if you're if you're turning out the right shoulder dance around is with that person you with right hand turn person. could you use that it's not it no it's the next one it's not it's the is next it? one yeah it's not that person no aha see this is why i used the coins before because exactly it's so hard to tell when you're alone <laughs> that's the thing i'm trying to imagine and i can't even i'm trying to visualize it and yeah. i can't no, it definitely needs people. It's the diagram. next person. Yeah. The one you're doing the right hand turn with is your original corner. And the one you end up with is the next one, the one that was directly across from you in the circle. Uh, huh. <laughs> Fascinating. OK, so the next dance we look at, we're going to uh, also hopefully address some of the questions that were asked in the pre-workshop survey. There were a lot of questions about this idea of lines or files or sides, whatever you want to call them, the people on either side of the set. This one, I am going to ask you all to work it through with me. I'm not going to offer you a solution. I am going to walk it through. I'm going to play you some of the music. The dance is Elephant Stairs. So here's the tune. person who suggested this, um, and I should say the survey was anonymous, so I have no idea who suggested what, but thank you to the person who suggested this. They asked specifically about the B part, and we are going to focus on just the B part, but like I said, I'll walk through the whole thing. Okay, so we can read the directions, one's figure eight, two's figure eight, you lead through across, lead through down, lead through across, and then cast and lead once and a half. It's a duple minor, so I'm going to start as a one, somewhat arbitrarily, I'll start in top second corner. Uh, so the one's figure eight, it starts with a cast, not a cross. So we cast down, we cross up, we cast down, we cross up, and then it's a turn single out, cloverleaf style to finish. Then the twos do the same, except they start casting up, but they've figure eighted, they do their cloverleaf turn out. At that point, it's a lead through a cross, and this is our kind of positional challenge, is how do we describe who leads across first? Um, in the dance, it would be those people. So we imagine them leading through us and then we lead through down and then we lead through across and then we all do a cast and lead once and a half cast and lead and cast, uh, not the best dancing I've ever done, but you get the point, um, to progress. So I'm going to put the instructions back and we're going to talk about how we might do that B part, how to convey who's on which side. So you can see I've put in orange, our little uh, 
positional challenge. Who leads a cross first and how do we describe them? What might we do? Or left file. We could use right file or left file, yep. Could be something in the room, like the door side and the window side. Mm -hmm. Say top first corner with your neighbor below. Yeah. Any other ideas? Left diagonal. The diagonals? How would they, what would they be doing? Looking down and you, you're looking to your left, you go first. Am I confusing things? I don't I am. I'm, you're confusing me, but that might not mean anything. Yeah. Um, confusing me. I have no idea. What? Just out so, of curiosity, because I'm not that familiar with the dance. Who does go first? It's the traditional gents side. Thank you. Um, and the twos have just finished their figure eight right before they do that. So we say had the bottom second corner gets to continue. There was another option that someone said that I put. Oh, uh, top first corner and okay. So if you use just said top first corner yeah. neighbor. You'd need to be clear, not the original, because everyone's on the opposite side from where they started. So you would need to make it clear from your current positions, not where you started. Everybody's home at that point. Everyone's home. <clears throat> yeah. Because you've done a full figure eight and a cloverleaf turn single. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I want to so think about what. Say again, Judith. Why is it left side, right side easy? That is an excellent question. You're facing a cross at that point. Yeah. Um, so for me, I honestly don't know. Why is it left side, right side? Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Norman. I think you're going to say what I would say. No, I just, so. She asked the question, why is left side, right side? Not, not easy, but it, you're facing a cross at that point. And I, I, to me, it wouldn't help. If I was identifying somebody by the maybe the top first corner or something like that, I might tweak to what they meant. Yeah, yeah. So for me, me, I think I think that left file and right file, the they're identified when you you face up, right? Everybody faces up, and then the people on the left are left file. I might I don't even know if I'm right about that, but I think well, it's I your shoulder. It's the shoulder that faces the top of the set that's towards the top of the set when you face. So if top. you're facing across and your right shoulder is up, your right file. That was my understanding. Okay. Yeah, I feel like for me, this is proving Norman's point. I find that very confusing. <laughs> Having said that, there are communities that left file and right file is so natural that people wouldn't think twice and you could just call that and you'd be all set, right? If I was calling in a place where left and right file happened, I would make sure I knew which was which. Uh, <laughs> clearly, I would need to do that before I started. But then I would happily use it because it simplifies things. One, one thought. Uh, it may work, is to identify the people at the beginning with numbers. In other words, before they start, you tell them that the, the, uh, the top first corner is number one. Um, and then you'll say, um, you know, one with the person on their right lead across, then one with the person on their left with their partner lead down and back. Um, and then you know, if you've labeled the partner as two, then they lead across. That's a, just a thought. Mm -hmm. Louise, this is Val from England. If you think about that leading through, if you think of it in terms of a circle, each person in that circle takes a turn of leading or being led and then leading and being led. So that might be another way of looking at it. Yep. I'm actually yeah. curious, this is Seth, uh, I'm curious why the clock side or window side, or maybe the people facing the clock, people facing the window, isn't 
I mean, left and right, some people are dyslexic and get confused about that. Whereas there's a clock and there's a window or a mirror or whatever the room is, seems more natural and easier to integrate. That's all mm -hmm. Zoom. <laughs> yeah, Zoom calling has thrown all the people who use geographical references into, uh, into confusion. But right, I mean, again, I think, uh, Seth, you're making the excellent point that this is, uh, this is something that you decide based on your situation, right? Like, uh, I think that's totally obvious. Um, if I'm in a space with a bunch of dancers uh, and we're all together and you have easy markers like that, everyone knows where the door is and everyone knows where the mirror is, then yeah, and I like that you specified, like, is it the side you're facing or is it the side you're on? Um, and I prefer to use the side you're facing because I'm like, if you're new to that dance, you can't see the clock behind you and you don't know it's there. But if you say clock people lead through and you're looking at a clock, you're done. It's easy. When I was thinking about it, I was thinking about flow and I was also thinking about um, who are the active people? You know, at the beginning, I said one of the questions that I asked myself is who are the actors or interactors? And in this case, it's a series, and this is, I think someone was saying this earlier and I'm sorry, I can't remember who, but it's a series of lead throughs that the second corners lead. And someone pointed out the bottom second corner continues their motion out of the uh, figure eight and clover leaf turn down. So I was thinking about saying something like out of the clover leaf, the bottom second corner can catch their neighbor's right hand in their left for a lead through across. I don't know. This is another dance that I haven't tried it on real humans, but that would be the experiment that I tried thinking about telling my dancers about flow because they lead through and then uh, it's a lead through down. So they're, uh, that leader's second corner, the ones lead down and then that same second corner scoops up their neighbor to lead across in the other direction. For me, that felt helpful. Like I said, I would try it on dancers. I don't think that's the right answer. I certainly think left file lead through, right file lead through in a community that uses those clock side, window side, um, those are also really good choices if you have people who are open to that. Um, the thing I like about saying this is a series of lead throughs is that you invite the dancers to think about it as a whole pattern instead of a, should I be doing something? Think about how the whole set is doing something um, that's building on each other. So yeah, um, lots of solutions. I'm just gonna say it for the hundredth time. There is no right answer. Um, but I think brainstorming like this, uh, is one of the things that I do when I'm preparing a dance to teach and call is I come up, I sort of force myself to come up with different solutions and see if they work. Um, because the brainstorming I think is an important part of the process. Yes. Um, Jeannie from England. I think that, um, the, what, what we would have to aim for is using the fewest words to get the message from the brain to the feet. Um, uh, you know, so not not uh, needing time to think about anything. So left file, right file, is almost as short as gents and ladies, um, and you know, clock side, etc. That would also work. But I think if we're using um, too many words, it's not going to work um, for people to react quickly. Absolutely, yeah. Part of that is teaching people, giving them new vocabulary that they can react to quickly, right? So if it's clocks and windows, you know, you might do a, a very simple dance where you introduce the concept of clocks and windows. And then this dance, which is not difficult, but is more challenging than uh, mm -hmm. sort of your average beginner dance, you could say uh, clocks and windows and they could focus on the figure and they wouldn't have to be thinking, am I a clock, am I a window? Because they'd done that already. Mm -hmm. So again, building your program to kind of build in vocabulary, but also thinking about um, their experience and what is, what's gonna be fast for them. Um, you know, I said in the introduction, I call, uh, I spend a couple months usually every year in the UK. And I, so I call in local dances in both places and the vocabularies that are familiar in the two different countries is quite different. Um, and when I started calling over there, it surprised me quite a lot. Uh, in a couple of instances. And so 
it's also useful as a caller to kind of chat with the organizer of the dance and say, you know, if I use this kind of language, will people understand it or will they not? Um, and think about building that. And if you have a local dance, you can build those skills intentionally over time. Good. Sorry, can I just comment? The one, the one comment I'll make in terms of using things like clocks and doors and kitchens or whatever is fine if you're basically calling in one hall. I call in probably 20 yeah. or 30 different halls. And, you know, I don't feel that I can change my the words that I speak. To, you know, oh, this, in this one, I've got to talk about a clock. In this one, I've got to talk <laughs> about a kitchen. So I, right. I don't like using that type of um, vocabulary because of the, the potential for saying the wrong thing. That's an excellent point. And that is also, I mean, in, in the solution that I offered, it was entirely based on the dancers and not on the space because I agree with you. I call all over the place and um, I am, uh, it's one of the reasons that positional calling appealed to me in the first place is my student dancers wouldn't use larks and robins, but they wanted to be gender free and they chose shoots and ladders, which is adorable. And I loved it, but I was like, okay, now I'm calling gents and ladies at this dance and shoots and ladders at this one. and larks and robins at that one and it's kind of um you know if i just got rid of those <laughs> it would make my life easier and i think similarly if, if i can figure out a way to call it without reference to the spe specific specific space then i would opt for that for that exact reason um so yeah kind of knowing i mean and that's partly knowing your own limits right like i uh i would be pretty embarrassed if i called clocks when i was supposed to be calling kitchen um, because I couldn't remember where I was. At the beginning of the workshop, I made the point that we are using skills that we already have. We only have 10 minutes left, so I'm not gonna dwell on this, but I would encourage you to think about what skills you already have as a caller that you are using to think about how to call positionally. And that's partly, like I was just saying, um, people have different strengths, right? So if you know you're really good at one aspect of calling, you can say, oh, how could my positional calling draw on that skill? Something that I haven't even talked about today that I could have talked about is tying your walkthrough to the music and letting the music help you um, help people know what to do. That would be a very specific kind of hyper specific workshop if we were to do it as a workshop like this. But when you're walking through dances and thinking through them and you're working with music, you can plan ahead and then you can turn to your musicians if you have live musicians and say, hey, in this part of the walkthrough, I'm going to ask you to doodle. And can you really emphasize this thing that I am also going to emphasize in my teaching? Because that's another tool we have, right? To help people learn how to do the dance. Um, uh, or you can even, you know, queue up a recording, do a similar thing. So there's a whole bunch of things we can do as callers that we already do that, uh, that are adaptable. I said that we wouldn't spend a whole lot of time on part three, but I do want to just briefly touch on it. Uh, so part three, making decisions. There are two big decisions that I think are relevant to positional callers specifically. Programming obviously is relevant to all callers, but when we think about programming, there are some things that I started to think about differently when I started doing positional calling. And one of those things was to use the program to reinforce positional concepts. So things like long first corners versus short first corners getting people used to thinking about there's someone on my immediate right diagonal, but also there's someone at the bottom of the set that's also on a diagonal. You could program that in and start to get people thinking about diagonals. There are all kinds of things. Like I use the example of the files, right? If you want to introduce a vocabulary to talk about sides of the set, then you can program that in. But the other thing that I wanted to touch on briefly was modifications. There are a whole bunch of reasons to modify dances. It's not just positional callers who modify dances. Someone in the pre-workshop survey uh, asked if we could talk about Comical Fellow, which starts with the ones uh, in sequence doing a set and fall back to their corners. As I was looking up dance directions, I found some group, dozens of groups uh, actually, who just let both the corners do it, right? So Comical Fellow, you could just say first corner is set forward, fall back, two hand turn. You don't have to make it just the ones doing that action. But maybe you don't want to do that modification. Maybe that doesn't feel good to you or your dancers. And so then you start thinking about a positional call that could accommodate that. And for me, with my dancers, that would be as simple as top first corner, set forward to your corner, fall back. Or something like ones, you're going to do this in sequence towards your corner, top first corner, set, fall back, two hand turn your corner. But uh, 
your dancers, um, you know, and this is something that has come up a lot in Zoom dancing, but was it was a factor beforehand? You know, how often when people teach a dance where only one of the corners is supposed to be moving, like like a set to your corner, how often does that other corner set anyway in real life? A lot. And so why not modify it? It makes the dancers happier. Our aesthetic is that we want to be moving. So modifications like that, uh, I think, are totally up to the collar. There are a lot of different solutions that you can have. But I think the real question is, when is a modification acceptable or useful? If you're doing dances that the whole point is to do them as they were done historically, or you're going through Andrew Shaw's reconstructions and you don't want to reconstruct his reconstructions because the whole point is that he spent a lot of time making them uh, how he wanted them, then you don't want to modify. But in other situations, you're calling to a room full of new dancers who just need to get oriented. Maybe modifications are what you need. What will give your dancers the best experience, I think, is the question there. And I do want to underscore that's a question that we have been asking ourselves as callers for all of calling. Um, that's not a new question for positional callers, but I think it's one that comes up a lot. That idea of modification does connect to one of the first questions that got asked in the survey which is, do you expect positional calling to change the repertoire? If so, how and how much? Um, and to be honest, uh, I don't think it has to. I think the repertoire changes because of what dancers want, not because of what callers do. Um, and so, yeah, I think if anything, um, positional calling might even expand the repertoire as people share their solutions for positionally calling dances. Um, I know I've collected dances because I'm like, oh, I want to think about how to do that positionally. Um, so it's expanding my repertoire. Are there other questions that you all very much wanted answered or that you want to ask each other? Yes, since no one's jumping in. Um, <laughs> Judy Greenhill from up in Canada, um, near Toronto. Hi, Beth. Um, OK, so you're doing a half your eight. Um, and normally, well, probably more often than not, you're doing it with your partner. So it doesn't really matter who goes first. Although sometimes you're doing it across the set, so it does. Do you, do you bother to specify when you're teaching that? Um, would you only specify it in a program where you had, some, had it at some point going across the set? Do you just tell them to decide one person goes first and go with it? Um, yeah, again, that's pretty context dependent with my student group. We do what I think is the Heather and Rose solution of the person on the right goes first. Um, when I'm dancing with someone I know, uh, as a partner, if it's a partner half figure eight, then we kind of make eye contact and just decide on the fly. Sure. I'm not, um, I think, I'm not, uh, <laughs> but I'm yeah, in terms of being prescriptive. Yeah. I, I would look at the choreography, like even if you're doing the half figure eight up and down, Often the thing that comes next requires that one person get there a little bit more uh, timely than the other. Right. And so then I would absolutely say, like, you should probably let the person on the left go first or whatever it is, um, sure. because they need to okay. do something next. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. That Jeff makes me first ask the great question in chat. Um, I'm guessing proper, improper is role specific. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so proper improper um, is the one thing that I think about really differently for contra dance than I do uh, in English. And in English, the only reason proper improper matters is uh, because it changes who your corner is. Uh, not the only reason it matters, but that's a big reason. Or because, like I was describing before, in a in a three couple set, if or a four couple set or whatever, if some of the couples are improper, people can get really thrown off by not ending the round on their home side unless you've worn them. So proper improper isn't connected to roles, it's connected to the side of the set you're on. Um, and if you think about it that way, then either to, to say if it's a long ways set, when you're out at the ends, if you don't want to switch roles, switch places, because that's how the dance is written. Um, but you know, a lot of English dance, I, it's a thing that contra dancers don't know is that English dancing is basically mostly role switching because every time you change direction in a long way set, you're basically changing what would be gender in contra. 
and you do completely different things, right? Like English dancers are just used to the fact that when you change directions, everything you do changes. Yeah, proper, improper. I guess it doesn't, uh, it's not role specific and it matters differently. And uh, I should probably have prepared kind of a short paper on this issue because it's, uh, it rewards thinking about very carefully, but it is um, useful if not necessary to point out in a lot of situations if you don't wanna throw people off. Um, I do, I am completely guilty of calling improper long ways dances without mentioning it. Um, and uh, people don't notice unless they know the dance already um, because they expect to do that role changing experience. Um, in your next workshop, will you be able to cover the proper improper and every, any other unanswered questions? Yeah, so on November 14th, we have the Contra version of this workshop. Oh, of um, yeah. And so I will be talking a lot about proper and improper in that workshop. I mean, not a lot, a lot, but I will be addressing it much more uh, centrally yeah. than I did today. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that in if you're wanting to um, have gender free dancing, then opposite on the wrong side or opposite becomes irrelevant because it's not. The reason why we do improper dances is so that men end up dancing with women and not men with men. But if you're not right. bothered about that, then actually being improper is completely irrelevant. Exactly. Yeah, which is why when I teach long ways dances, I sometimes don't mention it because it's irrelevant. Um, but uh, the cases that I've discovered it does matter is even if you have gender free dancing, in a set dance, like a three couple set or a four couple set, people do expect to end on the side they started on. So that's when I would warn them specifically that that's not gonna happen. Uh, Louise, do you draw a distinction between positional calling and gender-free calling? Or, uh, I quite, quite, can't quite yeah. think what I'm saying. There's a di <laughs> I, I, I think gender-free is slightly different to positional. So I think positional calling is genderless. Um, gender free calling, I that's it's an umbrella term that means a lot of things, and I would hesitate to uh, to say anything definitive about it because I think it encompasses uh, a bigger variety of things than position. Positional calling to me is just calling, like I said in the beginning, uh, using relationships between the dancers and the positions of the set and that's the information you have, so you dance that way. Um, it's not so much that it's gender free as gender irrelevant, right? Um, I mean, people joke, like the people on the dance floor still have genders. Um, they're just not part of the information that we're using to dance with. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much to Friends of Cecil Sharp House. Thank you to all of you who considered making a donation. Um, and like I said, you could donate to uh, ACT that we suggested, or you can donate to your local dance organization. I am really grateful for everyone who's helping us stay together in this uh, pandemic time. Big round of applause to all of you. Thank you for all your great contributions. And I hope that you all come to the next workshop. <laughs>